So we've talked about biblical foundations, the church planter, church structures, different models and regional strategies. Now I want to talk about church planting movements, where, as we've already talked about, maybe reaching a whole region, reaching a nation, and what are some of the factors that seem to contribute to the more rapid planting of churches, where it's not just so individual, but we actually move into church multiplication to saturate a region. And one of the people who's done probably the most research and writing that has become popular, a uh, person who's done the most research and writing uh, that's become widely read and used is David Garrison. And uh, about 2000, there was a booklet where he summarized his findings, and this booklet was made available uh, at no cost from the Southern Baptist. I think you can still download it online, just simply called Church Planning Movements. It's very short and to the point summarizes the main findings with a number of examples. A few years later, he came out then with his full-length book, uh, several hundred pages, Church Planning Movements, where he goes into much more detail on reporting about this. And then uh, more recently, a uh, sort of a handbook, as it were, called T for T, which means training for trainers, uh, a discipleship revolution, which is sort of a book that takes some of these ideas about how to do evangelism and how to reproduce churches and puts it into sort of a step-by-step, -step, almost week-by-week -week kind of uh, plan that can be used. And you can download these materials. There's videos. It is a, most of it, I believe, is available online at no cost. Um, it's available in various different languages. I think it's available in Russian um, and uh, numerous different languages. It's being used in many, many places as sort of a handbook that goes along with this concept of church planting movements. Well, that's pretty exciting to see these kind of things happening and that kind of church growth and that kind of uh, expansion of the kingdom. And uh, I imagine most of us, when we see those kind of reports, we say, oh, if that could only happen where I work. <laughs> and um, certainly such movements are a work of God. Uh, just by following some principles or methods, we cannot create movements. But we can do things that facilitate movements and that don't become unnecessary hindrances to movements. And that's what's a concern to us. Um, of course, some people will question, did everything happen exactly quite the way that they were re it was reported here? And um, that, that's really not our concern. God is moving in great ways. And the principles that are being advocated by advocates of church planning movements are principles that we can all learn from. And um, they're principles we've been talking about all along, really, as we've been going through our materials so far. And let me um, just summarize here a couple of the, the, the universal elements that were listed here. Um, extraordinary prayer, abundant gospel sowing, a lot of preaching of the gospel intentional church planting, uh, where that's really a goal, scriptural authority, that the Bible is central, um, local leadership, it's not expatriate people that are giving leadership to the movement, but local people being raised up, lay leadership, um, they're not paid workers, uh, cell or house churches, um, as you've seen, most of these that they're describing here were, were house churches, many of them are rural, most of these movements were rural, rapid reproduction, um, and then uh, healthy churches. So they're not necessarily waiting for one church to get really, really strong before they do something else, but really facilitating the moving forward fairly rapidly. And then common factors, uh, worship in the heart language, evangelism, having community implications, uh, rapid incorporation of new converts, passion and fearlessness, paying a price to be a Christian, uh, most of these movements either the church planter or local people were persecuted or experienced suffering. Uh, that was a common feature. Uh, a price to pay, pay is being a Christian. It's not easy to just sort of say, well, yes, I guess I'll be a Christian. Um, perceived leadership vacuum in society, uh, on-the-job training, uh, leadership authority that's decentralized, outsiders have a low profile, missionaries suffer. And so these are some of the universal elements, common factors. Um, we haven't seen these kind of dramatic movements um, in, in Europe or 
in the United States. We do see cell churches, though, that are multiplying cells, and so that could be considered uh, a church planting movement of sorts. But um, so uh, these principles, again, they're no guarantee that if we just do this, then these movements will happen. But um, they are helpful, and we want to be thinking in our context, what does this mean to, to apply or try and work according to these sorts of principles? Well, let's talk about uh, one of the most important features of uh, movements, and that is uh, multiplication. And um, I want to just describe this in this way, that multiplication is going to be something that just doesn't happen in multiplying churches as institutions. But if we're going to reproduce churches that are reproducing churches, it needs to happen at all levels. In other words, we need to multiply disciples, leaders, cells, and churches. And so, in other words, from the very beginning, when we start leading people to Christ and making disciples, that's coming through evangelism and discipleship. We're looking for leaders. Out of those new believers, very early along, we're looking for those with the potential to become leaders and developing them so they in turn become, through mentoring and developing, they in turn reproduce disciples. In other words, I might have been the first disciple maker, but now I'm training somebody else to be a leader to also be a disciple maker. Well, then we form a cell, and at the same time, I'm going to be empowering some of those leaders to lead those cells, but they should then start reproducing leaders so that they are now reproducing what they've done. They've not only made disciples, now they're making other leaders as they're working in cell groups. So as you have a cell group, you have a co-leader in that cell group. Well, when you have cells, then eventually you form a, a church. It's a larger body. And that's going to become by releasing those cells to become uh, the church. But we want to then reproduce cells. We can't reproduce cells unless we're reproducing leaders. We can't reproduce leaders unless we're reproducing disciples. And so the idea of teaching others to do also has to go all the way through so that we're increasing the number of disciples, increasing the number of leaders so that we can increase the number of cells. Then we can increase the number of churches. So some churches think this way. We will grow our church and we'll get our church strong and healthy. And then when we reach a certain size, we'll start a new church. And so I'm, I'm often asked, how big does a church have to be to plant a daughter church? Do we need to have 50 members? Do we need to have 100 members? Do we need to have 300 members? And I think that's actually the wrong question. I think the real question is, first of all, how strong is the church? But how strong is the vision of the church? And more importantly, is that church reproducing at all levels? If we just sort of wait until a church gets to a certain size and then say, well, we'll send off 20 people, that might lead to church addition. It rarely leads to church multiplication unless that reproduction and multiplication is part of the whole life of the church. In fact, I found that churches that say, well, when we get to 200 members, we'll plant a daughter church. Guess what happens when they reach 200 members? Like, well, maybe we ought to be 300 members because, you know, a church is never really strong enough. A church never has enough workers. A church never has enough extra money, does it? You always need more. And you always think, well, if we're just a little bigger, we'll be a little stronger. A lot of those churches never get to planning a daughter church. So it's not vision driven. So my philosophy is, as you're planning that church, you're leading people to become disciples, and then the leaders that come out of there, right now you've got to start reproducing disciples. Get reproduction going before you've even started church services. So you've got a cell group. Now you've got to reproduce leaders, otherwise you're not going to be able to have new cells. New cells need new leaders. So you've got to be reproducing leaders. Well, then you have your church. But if that church is going to grow, you've got to be reproducing the cells. And then when you have multiple cells, 
you've got reproduction through the whole system of the church, then you can actually reproduce churches, not just one, but multiple churches, because it's become a part of the very life of the church. And isn't that the way our bodies grow biologically? It starts with just one fertilized cell that then divides and becomes two and four and eight and so on. Babies aren't just conceived as whole beings. They grow in a cellular way and that cells reproduce and multiply. And so in the life of the church. So this, I believe, is one of the most important principles in church reproduction. Um, another factor is development of lay or bivocational church planters. And we heard this in David Garrison's. We've been talking about this all along, that we've got to empower people that don't cost a lot of money, but are equipped to become those church planters. And that allows multiplication to take place. And then, as we've said before, reproducible ministry methods. So we're using methods that are locally sustainable. You see, if every church has to look to a church in America to say, well, you build a building for us, well, then we're always going to be limited to the amount of partners we can find that will build buildings for us. We need locally reproducible methods. So maybe, maybe we still need buildings, but we need simpler buildings. Or maybe we don't need them at all. Maybe we need rented spaces or, or other options. Whatever it is, it needs to be locally reproducible so it can be locally sustained. Otherwise, we're constantly looking elsewhere. And I found that some churches spend more energy looking for help elsewhere, somebody else to help them, than just looking at what God has already given them. I believe God has placed in every church the resources they need if they can creatively tap those resources. And maybe the church doesn't need a big expensive building. Maybe the church doesn't need a paid pastor. But what does the church have? What are the gifts the church is given? What are the creative ways you can find solutions to the challenges? And uh, I think God leads in many ways. Now, one of the criticism points or questions that frequently comes up is, what about the health of these rapidly growing movements? When they grow so fast, you don't have a lot of mature believers leading these new churches. And so, are they healthy? Do they die out over time? And uh, that's a really important question. And one of the things we found in research is one of the keys, the real key for long-term sustainability. Any movement is going to eventually plateau. It's not going to indefinitely just continue to skyrocket in growth. But for it to sustain and not eventually go backwards will be the development of the leaders. That is going to be key. And this is where, again, creative ways of providing training for leaders, theological education, so they don't fall prey to false teaching or, or dominant personalities or other problems, will be training those leaders carefully. And this is where programs like theological education by extension, distance learning, we can't expect everybody to go and attend a seminary or Bible school. We have to find new ways to provide solid training and teaching for people so that these leaders of these rapidly growing movements can be strong leaders. I had one of our doctoral students, PhD study, that was done by Richard Hibbert, who had uh, worked in uh, uh, an Eastern European country where there was strong growth among Muslims. And um, the church grew rapidly. Um, I think it was around 10,000 believers. It was a remarkable growth, and everybody was quite excited about that. Ten years later, the numbers in the churches were about half of that. What had happened? Explosive growth over a short period of time, and then ten years later, it looked like there had been a great loss. And so his research was to actually look what happened in those churches. Why did they seem to go backwards so dramatically? Well, a lot of people had migrated to the West when the Iron Curtain came down. People went West, they got jobs. He found that of the people, he interviewed people who left the churches. 
He found people who left, and what were their reasons for leaving? Interestingly, he found only one person that returned to Islam. Most of the people still remained believers in Jesus, but they didn't affiliate with the church. And there were many, many different reasons that were given why people left. But if there was a common theme, it was poor leadership. Leadership that was in conflict, leadership that had bad teaching, leaders that had moral failures, leaders that abused their power, leaders that did not give good pastoral care. So you had this explosive movement, but they were not able to keep up with the strength of the leadership. And the strength of a movement will, over the long haul, be no stronger than the spiritual strength of its leaders. What did Jesus say? The blind leading the blind, what will happen? They'll both fall in the ditch. And so this is why it's one thing to get excited about rapid growth, evangelism, churches being started on the front end of a movement, but we have to work equally diligently on the infrastructure and the strengthening of that movement, uh, and particularly in the strengthening of the leaders, so that that movement is a healthy movement. And we'll talk about church health later on as we go. TBS Seminary is a nonprofit project. Our joint effort will bring about the common purpose of making Christian education available around the world and developing good Christian servant leaders. You have a unique opportunity to partner in this effort through your prayer and or financial support of TVS Ministry. For more information, please visit tvsseminary.com. Now let me give you a few application questions here to be thinking about what this means for you and where you work. First of all, to what extent is your, experience, uh, is your ministry experiencing reproduction at all levels? Disciples, leaders, cells, and churches. What do you need to do to change that? What can be changed to encourage reproduction at all levels? Maybe you've been protecting ministry that the pastor has to do everything. And maybe the pastor is afraid to release other people to do ministry. If you do not have a releasing and empowering philosophy of ministry, you'll never reach church reproduction. And how might lay or bivocational church planners be developed in your context? How can you encourage ordinary people who might never get theological training or become a pastor to become the key people for starting something new? And finally, how reproducible are your ministry methods? How should they change to promote reproduction? Let me ask now um, what questions you students in the room here have uh, as you've been hearing about church planning movements and uh, some of the principles we've been talking about. What questions come to your mind? We will have been talking about uh, uh, different strategies uh, and different movements and what we can do. But also you mentioned that uh, the most important is the work of the Holy Spirit. Is there any theory, any understanding how can we recognize the movement of the Holy Spirit? Because as we look at the Russian situation, we know that in the 90s there was a big movement and several churches were planted in the central part of Russia and now it's kind of uh, slowing down. What do we do? <laughs> well, you know, if we could predict the movement of the Holy Spirit, we'd be smarter than Jesus. Remember what Jesus said with Nicodemus? He said, you know, the Spirit is like the wind. It blows where it will, and you, you can't really predict how God is going to work. And that's a mystery. Um, we can pray. We can first of all pray that we personally are not quenching the Holy Spirit through our sinfulness, through our pride, uh, through our desire to make things happen, um, but we're constantly confessing and in dependence on God. I think sometimes, particularly those of us that do have resources and training, we tend to think, well, we can just do this if we try hard enough. And uh, we need to trust God more. I think that's part of it. But there's really no formula. And sometimes God is moving at a certain time, in a certain moment in history, and then his hand pulls away. 
I think that the Word of God is always going to be a key. Um, you know, when we look at the New Testament and, and some of the statements in the New Testament about how the church grew, just, a, just sort of a, a quick listing in the book of Acts, Acts 9.31, uh, then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace. It was strengthened and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. It grew in numbers, living in fear of the Lord. Acts 11, uh, the Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. Uh, Acts 12, 24, but the word of the Lord continued to increase and spread. Um, Acts 13, 49, the word of the Lord spread through the whole region. Acts 19, 10, uh, that all the Jews and the Greeks in the province of Asia believed and so on. It seems that in the book of Acts, the work of the Spirit is always linked to the word of God. And where the word of God is preached and the power of the Spirit, things happen. There's no guarantees. Uh, there are places where Paul preached where there was not a great response, places like Athens. And so again, we have to depend on God, but we do want to be faithful in preaching the word, teaching the word. That's the most we can say to that. And keep praying for revival. <laughs>